gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kenneth Hamilton, a scholar and a pianist whom I greatly admire. Uh, Dr. Hamilton has been described by The Guardian as a pianist, author, lecturer, and all-round virtuoso, which I think is a fair description. Uh, Dr. Hamilton concertizes regularly, playing both the modern piano and historical keyboard instruments. He is one of the world's leading experts on 19th century performance practice. Uh, Ken keeps up a pretty dizzying schedule of international lectures and performances, so we are very fortunate that he has made it to the Princess Galliani Watana Institute of Music for our symposium this year. Ken is one of those uh, very refreshing scholars who is just as interested in sharing musical insights and ideas with the general public as he is in sharing them with his fellow scholars. Uh, this endeared me to him uh, long before we met in person. His book, After the Golden Age, which examines piano performance in the 19th and early 20th centuries, was a, a revelation to me personally, as I know it was for uh, many musicians. Dr. Hamilton's recent projects include two recordings. Kenneth Hamilton plays Ronald Stevenson and Back to Bach, tributes, transcriptions um, by Liszt, Rachmaninoff, and Busoni. Both have been met with critical acclaim. Upcoming releases include a CD titled Preludes to Chopin, in which Ken will treat Chopin's preludes as actual preludes. Uh, in other words, playing them before larger works by Chopin that they complement. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Kenneth Hamilton. Hello? Is this? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Whoops, very loud. Could we have that turned down slightly? Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Princess Galliani Institute of Music um, and to be the first speaker and performer at this conference on mu musical metamorphosis or, or, or metamorphoses. Now, um, metamorphosis simply is simply the, the Greek way in ancient Greek of saying transformation to change something. Um, yet most musical institutes like yours are, most of your institutes like, are, are entitled conservatories, musical conservatory. And um, a conservatory actually by definition does the opposite of change. In fact, what it does is conserve things, it keeps them the same. It cultivates and preserves knowledge. So when conservatories, so-called, were originally set up 150 years ago or so, the idea was to conserve a central repertoire of music, much of which is still, is still with us today. And in many respects, this concept is the opposite of metamorphosis of musical change, which is why I'm actually pleased to be at the Princess Galliana Institute and not conservatory because an institute does not imply any, any sort of preservation, although you do preserve, but it, it implies an openness to change in the future, which is something I've noticed here when I've been he here in the past. And now, the term metamorphosis was most famously used in the classical world but by the poet Ovid. The, the Roman, the Latin poet Ovid wrote a enormously long poem called The Metamorphoses, which was legends of transformations, of, of people turning into animals, of animals turning into people, of things being transformed. Most famously, the prophet Tiresias, who was transformed from a man into a woman, and then back from a woman into a man, strangely suitable for today's modern culture, I would have thought. Um, what was transformed in order to see whether life was better as a woman or as a man. If you want to know what he thought, then you'd better read the original Ovid poem. I won't, won't go, go into that there. But it was all about trans, transformation. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you today is also about musical transformation, but it's not musical transformation in the sense of compositional variation as such, um, or the famous transformation of themes 
of the, of the 19th century is to do with transformation in performance styles and connected really with one of the main standard repertoire piano composers of Chopin um, because uh, I, I think a lot of the st a lot of students undoubtedly a lot of music students today and a lot of audience members don't actually realize how much performance style has changed um, even in terms of standard repertoire now usually in, in talks like this um, I am supposed to end with saying how dreadful all these changes are and, and how we need to go back to the original Chopin. I'm not going to say that. I think life and history is really a process of change and if one tries to stop the process of change, one will fail. That it needs to be accepted and even celebrated and most importantly directed, which is what the young musicians here can most especially take a part in, directing the process of change. But in order to direct the process of change with knowledge, in other words, to direct musical metamorphosis with, not, with knowledge, we really need to know um, what has gone before. Because there is also in English a very famous saying that uh, if you do not understand history, you are condemned to repeat it. So in order to do something genuinely new, we actually have to know something about what, what went, went on in the past. Um, so let's go back to Chopin, which will be my, my illustration, and I'm going to be talking to you here, and I'm going to be play, playing on the piano. Um, the fact is that there is no such thing as a pristine, original, single, inviolable performance style for most composers, just despite what, what some um, scholars and performers would, would have you believe. Chopin is an especially interesting example because what he writes in his musical scores was often very diff different, not just from what he played in terms of the notes, but the playing style. We know, for example, that Chopin was, was consumptive, was ill, was, was not a very strong person, um, played mostly very softly, hated playing in public. He would have hated a large audience like this prefer to play just to small numbers of people. He said concerts, he famously said, are not real music um, because all the most subtle effects of art are not possible in concerts. They were only possible in private performance. So even at the inception, at the beginning of Chopin's Chopin performance history, there was a bifurcation between the Chopin style as played by the composer and Chopin as written in the score. And then a third style, really contemporary with Chopin, was really the style of public pianists, pianists like, like Liszt and his students, who developed a style of Chopin playing really designed for the audience. And it's in fact this style of Chopin playing, the, the, the Listian style, the public virtuoso style of Chopin playing, that is the most commonly prevalent one today, so that the evolutionary timeline, the, the timeline of metamorphosis for Chopin actually doesn't start with the composer, but actually starts with the composer's performance contemporaries. Now, um, I'm going to go to the piano now, we can, uh, and, I, and I will give you some examples of what I, what I think is, shall we say, original Chopin, um, and, and then basically try to trace the, sh the changes through time. Um, and I'm going to most, mostly take very famous pieces because pieces you all know because there's no point in me taking an obscure bit of Chopin that nobody knows what it sounds like anyway and then claim that it's very different or whatever. However, um, let, let's, take, let's take the most famous piece of all Chopin, the, the Octur Nocturne Opus 9, number two. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, st I'll start. I will start with a standard performance of Opus 9, number two, just, pl just play the, f the first few bars. Okay, so perfectly nice, nothing, nothing wrong with it. And that, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's, 
It's very kind of you, but if you applaud every time, then we will never finish. And we'll, but, th but, th but thank you. Um, nothing wrong with that, and that's what it says in the score. That's what's written in the score. First thing is, nobody in Chopin's day would ever have started like that. That you, you always had to improvise or play it some sort of short introduction. So, so nobody, nobody would ever just sit down and play the beginning. You needed some sort of introduction in Chopin's day. It wasn't written down, but it was expected. Okay, um, so so and so so we need something before the beginning of the piece if we're going to perform it in a style that maybe would have been recognisable in the 1830s. Then listen, listen to my listen to my left hand. I know of no early recording from the early 20th century it play, plays the left hand like that. And it, it seems to me not demonstrable, but highly likely that Sh in Chopin's day, all of that would have been arpeggiated. Um, in fact, there are se several sources during Chopin's day that says the accompaniment should sound like a guitar, it says. And of course, guitarists don't tend to play block chords like that. They spread things, so the, so the accompaniment in, in virtually all early recordings and, and in Chopin's, they would have been arpeggiated in some way. Okay, so we're getting a bit closer now to, to, the, to the style. However, there's one final thing that we would add on top of that, and that is the idea of metamorphosis itself, of variation, effectively. Because again, in Chopin's day, you wouldn't just play a piece like that. You would vary it, change it, ornament it in some sort of way. And we're, we're lucky with this piece because it was so famous, e even in the composer's own lifetime, that we know how he tended to vary the piece in performance, and we know what he recommended to his students. So we have a whole load of sources um, of variations for this piece, performance variations, okay? Um, they weren't designed to be fixed variations. They were designed to be ideas which you could adapt or vary or metamorphose, to use the title, and change as you wish. But they were designed to give and illustrate the sort of thing you ought to do. And the aesthetics behind this, the aesthetic theory, is that music like this should sound like a singer, should sound like a singer of Italian opera of the contemporary era, of the 1830s, in other words. And therefore, the melody should be varied like a singer of, an, of Italian opera in the 1830s would have done. Um, so we don't have to speculate for this. We know that this is the case. Um, so we have a whole list of variations that we could do or something similar or invent our own in the same sort of way. So I will, ca I will carry on with the piece. Um, we go to the next stanza. Here's what's written. Thank you. 
Um, but look, the point is that that gives you an idea of the scope within the style. The, the, the point is that no single performance should be identical to that, okay? And, um, and you can hear your musicians, you can hear that the one thing all these things have in common is that they follow the basic harmony and outline of the original melody. Yeah, I, I, but they just expand upon it, and, and if they take too long, the left hand just stops. And it's exactly the same as Frank Sinatra, or jazz, or pop music. It's just the same sort of thing. It's a continuous variant. And at the end, all the score is actually telling you to do is to play, play E-flat major, do something in E-flat major. That's what it's telling you to do, okay? Um, now, 90% of maybe 95 or 99% per, per percent of performances, I've heard, modern performances I've heard of this piece, just plays the score, sometimes very beautifully, sometimes very boringly. And there's nothing wrong with that. A, a possible variant in Chopin's day was just playing it as written, but it was regarded as the sort of thing a student did who didn't know any better. It was regarded, to, to use the term of the violinist, uh, Louis Spohr, he distinguished between between a sort of good performance and a fine performance or artistic performance, a correct performance, he said. So what, what we have nowadays, according to Spohr, would be a correct performance. But the next level was the, the fine performance, the, the artistic performance, so which, which those sorts of variants would give. So basically, um, the meaning of this piece, the way we perform has changed over time. And here's the funny thing. Nothing I've said to you there, well, most of it, and it, most of what I've said to you there is quite common knowledge among Chopin scholars and indeed some players, but nobody wants to, nobody or hardly anybody seems to want to play it according to the original performance practice now because, and this is again my, my assumption or, or rather my guess from the situation, because it involves too much um, essentially willful personal variation. And this is again for the idea of we are conserving music, not producing it for communication. The idea seems that we conserve this piece according to what the score seems to say. But of course, what the score would have said to somebody in 1831 is different from what it, from what it says today. Okay, so that's the first point, that um, sometimes conserving something is actually changing it without knowing. But, and, I, and what I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with changing it, but we should be changing it from knowledge rather than ignorance. Now, I need to check the time to make sure I'm going out. I'm fine. Okay, now, next famous piece, Study Opus 10, number three. Um, very famous Chopin, Chopin tune. Um, I will play it again, what I think is a roughly average type of performance nowadays. Um, again, nothing wrong with it. Fine, um, except that it's almost about half the speed that, that Chopin actually indicated. We, we're really resistant to performing this piece at anything like the, the metronome mark. Um, we might say, people say this with Schumann all the time, the metronome mark is wrong. Schumann's metronome was faulty, was always the argument. Uh, so, so we are, oh, and Beethoven's metronome was faulty as well, by the way, that's the other argument, the metronomes are all wrong because nobody can accept the, the tempo markings that Beethoven wrote for Opus 106 for the Hammerklavier Center. And nobody can accept, nobody can accept that the, the um, beginning of the Schumann Piano Concerto could possibly be uh, I'm, 
afraid that's, that's, now we may prefer it at the slower tempo, that's fine, but that's actually not what, what, what was indicated. And if, if, we, if we want to change it, we then have to say, oh, but the metronome was wrong, okay? Um, which is, seems highly unlikely. Um, okay, let's go, back, let's go back to the Chopin. Um, it's not just the metronome, Mark. Basically, it's written in two beats in a bar, not four, okay? Um, and there are several internal aspects that show that the slower tempo was unlikely to be the tempo intended for a start. It's written in 2-4. Um, if I play it at this tempo... Seems less natural, kind of da 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 di two one da 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 yeah okay. Um, now the metro mark tempo is this. Um, The central section Chopin marks a little faster, poco più mosso, uh, and it obviously has to go quite a bit faster if you're playing a slower tempo, so poco più mosso. some pianists do is, is start slower in the middle section and then speed up um, very obviously. I, I, I sometimes call this the Hungarian Rhapsody interpretation because the people playing it on the outside know that it really has to go faster but they don't know how to get from the slower tempo to the faster one. So, you, so um, what tends to happen is something like this. Sounds like a list hung Hungarian rhapsody, but if you're playing it in the faster tempo anyway, um, it's not really necessary because we end up with um, So I think what we usually hear nowadays is, is this. The later editors couldn't decide whether to use the major form or the minor form, and so just decided to put them both together. And in fact, it's beautiful. It's far better than it's far better than the original. Um, okay, now, but look, this is the point. I should be now saying to you, this is terrible. We all ought to be playing this at the faster original temp tempo because it makes more sense. And in fact, structurally speaking, 
in, t in terms of all sorts of aspects of the notations and the coordination of tempo with the middle section, um, it makes a lot more sense. And it's pretty obviously what, what was intended. Um, however, I'm not saying that to you at all. What I'm saying is that this is part of the, the transformation or the change or the metamorphosis of this piece over time. There's nothing right or wrong about it. It reflects changing tastes. This piece was slowing down even during the 19th century. In Chopin's day, it, I won't bother you with the sources, which are all very boring, but um, in Chopin's day, it was, it was played really more or less at the metronome tempo, which is, which is, is actually more suitable for an, for an early instrument anyway. But by, by, by the 1880s, we know that Liszt was, was playing this piece very slowly, at least the outer sections, because one of his pupils heard him play it and said he took the main melody very slowly. Um, he, he said, so Liszt is an old man, plays this very slowly. Um, and then there's a, the, the earliest complete recording of the studies by Wilhelm, as far as I know, by Wilhelm Backhaus, um, per, also performs it at the slow tempo. Now, when, when, I, when I was 20 years ago, um, I, I used to, I, I was very pleased with the fact that I realized that this was meant to go faster. And I used to play it faster. And every time I played this piece at the Mark Temple, audience members would always come up to me afterwards and say, why do you play this piece so quickly? They would always say, and I would say, I'm not playing it quickly. I'm just playing it at the speed it's indicated in the score. Um, but what I was doing at that point was fighting against audience expectations and culture. The fact is that pieces of music change their meaning over time. We can't prevent it. It will happen, there'll be all sorts of, wh why did this slow down? It slowed down partly because of heavier pianos, heavier instruments. It slowed down partly um, because of late romanticism where the, the idea of Wagner used to say, yes, Va Wagner used to say, uh, uh, the ideal adagio is as slow as possible and the ideal allegro is as slow as possible so that that piece began to approach the Wagnerian ideal of the ideal. Um, adagio. And then finally, the last thing is it was turned into a Hollywood song, um, sung by lots of people, including Richard Tauber and things like that. And as a Hollywood song, the song was called So Deep Is The Night. It was performed at a really, really slow tempo. So um, roughly the slow tempo here. Anybody in the West over a certain age remembers the song. So when they hear the pianist coming to play the tune, they expect the, the, the tune to be about the same tempo as the song, and, and they don't like it. They're, they're puzzled if they hear it significantly faster. Um, so this used to be my argument, but you know what? I now, I, I now go, my own performance of this piece has been getting slower slower over the last 10 or 20 years, and eventually now I sit down, um, I sit down and do it about this with, with extra arpeggiation as well.
lovely, and, and I, I, know it's, I know it's not according to what I think Chopin, Chopin would have wanted, but actually I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care much. Um, I, all, all, I'm, all I really care now is whether I'm playing it in a way that means something to me. Um, so, in, but, but I think I know, I, I've tried to trace how the, ch how the changes have worked in the past, and I've tried to make my own peace with, um, with this idea of authenticity, and I've come, come to the conclusion that the only authenticity that really matters is authenticity to yourself. Um, that, that really, it, it is important for us as musicians to know as much as possible about the musical notation, about performance history, about the changes in instruments, it, about how the piece changed over time, and yes, as far as we can tell about the original intentions um, of the composer. However, the, the, the piece changes over time, the way audiences think of it, the way audiences hear it, changes over time, you cannot unthink 150 years of music history. You cannot, as, as the cliche goes, you can, have, you can have an original performance, but you can't have an original audience. You will always be playing to a 20, 21st century audience. Um, so what's the only authenticity left, I think, is a performance that at least says something to you. M music is not just a message from another human being <coughs> in the past it is partly that but it's also an individual artistic entity in itself that the meaning of which necessarily will change to some extent through time it is necessary to conserve the original meaning in the sense of getting to know it because it will give you insights into what the message probably and I'm using my terms very carefully probably was but ultimately, we have to be part of the metamorphosis. We have to be part of the change. Because stasis is death in, in, in any art form. If something stops evolving, it dies. Yeah? Um, it's the same in nature, whatever. So it, we have to constantly create something that is, if, if not completely new, at least continuing to be meaningful to us. Now, the past can give us this as well, because sometimes the past can be new too. In other words, to go back to the Chopin Nocturne, in fact, a, a, a performance according roughly to the original style is actually fairly new now. It was a point that the scholar Richard Taruskin made 20 years ago, that, that, um, that, er, that, that, that authentic original performance style is the most modern performance style there is because it's, basic, it's basically new. In going back to the past, we've created something new. But ultimately, what we have to do is play with conviction, something that actually speaks to us. Um, we may be preserving certain elements of the composer's original meaning. Maybe we are, maybe we're distorting it. Uh, in my view, as long as we do this with, with knowledge and thought, um, then there is nothing ethically wrong with it. Most issues in performance practice, in my view, have ended up being issues of morality and ethics rather than actual music. The question is, does it speak to you? Are you able to play this with conviction? Um, and is it internally coherent? Is your, is your interpretation at least internally coherent? And then, basically, gather as much knowledge as you can and do, then do what you like with honesty once you've established your career. <laughs> because those of us in the audience here um, who are, a anybody in this audience over the age of 35 can do exactly what I'm saying because you will, all, you will either have made your, established your career or you're not gonna have one anyway, so either way, it doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> um, either way, but, but so, so you as younger performers have to, have a more difficult dance with the expectations of your teachers, the expectations of the critics, the expectations of juries, of panels, of auditioners, or whatever. Um, but you will have a better chance of meeting these expectations if you are thoughtful about what exactly your style, your style of interpretation is projecting. And then if you survive all this, if you get to middle age with a, with a career, then ultimately, you, you, you become a Nietzschean, that your own, your own conviction of the music 
is, is going to be what counts because the only thing you will ultimately perform with proper authenticity and conviction is your own interpretation of it. You can never be anybody else very convincingly, but you can be yourself very convincingly. So the final message, that is a little bit about how Chopin has changed. Be part of the change. We are not here to preserve things. We are here to create something new, even in a, even a little way. Um, at the, when, when Wagner used to get brought, brought compositions by, by young composers, um, he, he would turn to them and he would say, you know, Kinder schafft Neues, children, do something new. So what we're talking about is the metamorphosis of history, but use that knowledge to do something new. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth, for that fantastic presentation, which really spoke from my heart. That's exactly what I think as well. And uh, I was reminded to a very famous uh, text by Walter Benjamin called The Artwork in Times of uh, Artificial Reproduction. So what is your opinion about uh, modern technology, CDs, YouTube, when you see all the standardized uh, performances and people try to imitate the standardized performances. What do you think about this influence on that, what you just have said? Thanks, Dieter. Look, that's a very good question. And in, in fact, I, I missed out that entire area because basically what I'm talking about here is live performance. Okay. Recordings commodify music. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but a, re a recording fixes something. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that, that interpreting Chopin according to this idea of stylistic variation is not so popular nowadays is because the very concept or the very aesthetic is an anti-recording aesthetic. Um, in other words, what Chopin gives or gave his students was a series of possibilities. In other words, a frame of reference, an artistic frame of reference within which the piece should be played, could be played. What a recording does is fix one of these frames of reference. Now look, I actually just recorded this Chopin Nocturne just a few days ago, the, the E-flat one. And, and I, I played a little prelude. I did it really to annoy the critics because I knew a lot of people were going to hate this, you know. So, um, and, and I played a little prelude and I, and I, I chose a selection of, of, of some variants. Sometimes I played them slightly differently as well. But as soon as I fix that in a recording, I'm actually going contrary to the aesthetic, okay? Um, and I also did things that are actually very, very sort of 21st century in that I chose, the, the, the variants I chose were getting more and more complex, so I created a, 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 an arrow of complexity through the piece. I don't think that's what that was intended to be if we're talking about intention at all. It was basically intended to be a series of possibilities. There's no reason why the simplest variant shouldn't appear at the end. So, so I created a goal-directed arrow, so, but partly because I myself am a very goal-directed person and that's how I think about things. Now, um, as, as Dieter is implying in his question, as, as, as soon as recording becomes the main, the main medium of musical listening, the aesthetic game changes. It, it becomes something it says on the tin. Um, most of you, pro we all, almost 90% almost of the music we hear now in any context is recorded music. It's just, just, just inevitable. Now, as soon as, I, I, as soon as I produce a recording that says Chopin Polonaise, just like if I produce a tin can that says Heinz baked beans on it, okay? People are going to expect that, that this tin can has Heinz baked beans in it. Likewise, they're going to expect a Chopin Polonaise or a Chopin Nocturne, um, and they're going to expect that this corresponds with the score that says Chopin Nocturne, usually as read by 21st century sensibilities. 
Okay, so we have a commodification, and, and this is one of the, the expectations have changed. One thing. Secondly, um, in Chopin's day, all you heard was live music. You didn't know how something was played in Berlin. You were in Paris. You had no idea how this was played in Berlin or New York or wherever else, unless a pianist from Berlin happened to turn up and said, no, no, we do this differently in Berlin, okay? Whereas nowadays you have access to dozens, sometimes hundreds of performances, and what a lot of people do is, is go to the, the most famous performances and then sometimes not even intentionally, but just co but copy it sometimes, yeah. And so the result is an assimilation to the norm um, and it, it, to some extent, it's unconscious, you know, but uh, other times it isn't. Um, here's the thing, go to YouTube and listen to Rachmaninoff playing his second piano concerto, okay? It's mostly massively faster than most people play it, play it nowadays. He reverses, literally reverses the dynamic markings in many places, um, and the basic concept is, is not according to the norm. But we don't go back to Rachmaninoff, we go back to a general averaged out modern standard performance. Um, I don't see any way of avoiding this, Dieter. It's just, you know, it's, ju it's just the, but be aware, okay? You have choices and the choices, you have fewer choices as younger performers. So there's no, there's no doubt. You have to navigate the expectations of, of your teachers, of your judges, as I say, of, of juries, of critics. The more established you get, the more you can flaunt these expectations. You, you know, Horowitz, you know the old Horowitz, old Horowitz recording, Horowitz would never really have got through round one of most piano competitions now because the playing was too eccentric, would be regarded as too eccentric. Um, so, so navigate your own career, but you know, there is an, esse an essential assimilation. And the more secure you become, both personally and professionally, the more you will be able to reject these expectations. Until then, I'm counseling artistic prudence and a hope for the future. But thanks for the question. <laughs> Just a quick follow-up, I, I also thought, um, as you were talking a lot about recordings, and I just had the thought when you were answering the question that perhaps the internet and YouTube will change things somewhat. Um, just because I know a lot of younger people now often go online to listen to recordings, and this opens up uh, like a lot more possibilities, and also there's a wide variety of live recordings, which when you see the video has a very different effect on you than when you look at an actual CD or listen to something that's been made in a studio. So I wonder about your thoughts on that. And then I, I also just wanted to ask, um, you know, when you, you talked a lot about audience expectations and how that sort of the, the pressure on performers in a way to sort of conform to what audiences expect. And I wonder if you feel that um, we actually have some obligation to sort of embrace the discomfort a little bit and to maybe challenge audiences on occasion with uh, maybe something that they may not like as much, um, even though just to open things up or to help as you say, uh, direct the metamorphosis. Thanks. Um, I'll, do, I'll do that in reverse order. Um, I don't think of it as an obligation. Actually, again, I, 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 don't, I don't believe music is an ethical issue. I don't believe performance practice is an ethical issue. I believe performance practice is about choices, but uh, it's also about taste, and I don't regard taste as an ethical issue. If, if I want to eat chicken and you want to eat lamb or fish, it's not an ethical issue, I, you know, it's, it's, it's just your taste. And, and I think part of the problem in music is that we have elevated taste to, to ethics. In other words, a teacher will say, this should be done like this, which is, is a general moral statement effectively. Whereas one could say, it is almost certain that Chopin would have done it like this, or I believe it to be more effective, or 99% of performers think that's terrible. All of this is true. <laughs> But but the should be done is that so so I, I know what if I if I can rephrase that in in um, non non ethical terms if if your conviction goes against expectations then then do it according to where you are in your career and and you can make up you could even walk into round one of a competition because competitions are very unmusical anyway and say I, I know they're going to hate this yeah they're going to hate this but I, at least I will be in round one and they'll hear it you know and that's fine. You, you can be your own judge of that, no, 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 nobody else. Um, so, 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 it, so I agree with you. 
removing the ethical, ethical component. Um, to go back to the, the, the YouTube, there, is a there are a huge number of things on YouTube, um, and it's much, much more easily, ac except, but not in China. This is the interesting thing. I mean, this is the, you know, in cer certain, certain censored in internet regimes or whatever, so, so one has to work, work out, work out where, where one is. Um, there is a natural, human beings are herd animals. We're all herd animals. We have a herd instinct. Um, and even if something is, shall we say, authentic, or, or so, there's a tendency to drift away to the, to the, to the general, general ima image of something. So the, w uh, one of the other things I recorded a few days ago was, was one of the pieces I'm playing tonight, and there's a, uh, the, the Godowski Künstlerleben, Ar Artist Life, Waltz Metamorphosis, Symphonic Metamorphosis. And, and there's one recording that's totally out of line with anything I've ever heard, and it's actually by Godowski's son-in-law, David Sapperton. Um, and it, it's, utterly, it's utterly eccentric. It slows down, it speeds up in bizarre sorts of ways. It, it changes things, it, 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 re, it reharmonizes things, even given the fact that Godowski's already reharmonized. It's great fun, but it would be career suicide for anybody to play it like this now, nowadays. Not only that, why would you, this is David Sapperton, why channel David Sapperton, you know? Um, channel yourself. Maybe be inspired by Sapperton. I mean, to be honest, I didn't like a lot of it. I, I kept thinking, what on earth is he doing? You know, this sort of thing. Um, so I wasn't likely to copy it because I didn't, didn't like it. But, but ultimately, take ideas. Take ideas from your teachers. Take ideas from YouTube. And, and never expect that your performance performance on recording is going to be the same as, as even your idea next week. Sometimes I change my idea about a piece between recording it and getting the first edit of the recording. <laughs> and then I think, no, maybe that shouldn't have been like that or, or, or something like that. You know, so, so music is essentially in metamorphosis. And, and you know, there used to be a, a famous English king, King Canute, who was very famously stupid 1,500 years ago because he tried to keep back the waves. You know, he, he sat with a throne and demanded the waves go back. You as a musician will never push back the tides of change in history. All you can do is do your own little, little bit of controlling it. And ultimately, the only thing you're totally in control of, within reason anyway, is yourself and your own uh, performance. So do your little bit to shape history. Listen to YouTube, and you're right, Alyssa, there's, there's much more done. And, and then adapt. Music, the golden mean can be really boring. It can be like a sort of, you know, second-rate German orchestra's performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony for the 350th time. They're all good musicians, but it's just really boring. Um, so I'll tell you something. There is only one sin in music, and that's being boring. Nothing else matters. You could even be really bad and interesting. Florence Foster Jenkins was one of the most fascinating performers I've ever heard in my life and certainly one of the most entertaining because she was one of the worst. But the ultimate sin is being boring because as soon as you're boring, you've lost the attention of the audience and nobody's listening to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ken. It was a, a wonderful talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, we're going to take a break for coffee. Um, so we